Okay, all right, so we're um, two lessons away from being finished with our Old Testament survey. Um, so we will finish with uh, the 12 next week. And uh, then, Frank, are you going to start immediately into New Testament surveys? Yes. Okay. All right, so we'll, we'll finish. Uh, we'll do, we did uh, five of the 12. And when I say the 12, I mean the, the mi- more readily known as the minor prophets. But as I shared last week, we, you know, I like to refer to them as the 12 for the reasons we gave. Um, it's, it is one book, uh, ultimately. So we did uh, through Jonah last week, and we're going to do Micah through Zephaniah this week. Um, just as a sort of real quick review, um, remember there's three sections to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, you know, people refer to it as the Tanakh. It's the, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. So it's the, it's the law, the first five books of the Bible. It's the, um, the prophets who are broken into the former prophets, Joshua through Kings, and then the latter prophets, Isaiah through the Twelve. And then it's the writings, things like Psalms and Proverbs and Job and Ecclesiastes and Daniel. So that's how the the Bible is divided. The Hebrew Bible is divided. Of course, we have the exact same books in the English Bible, just in a little bit of a different order and uh, sometimes not grouped. We say we have 39 books of the Old Testament. They say they have, uh, the Hebrew Bible has 22 or 24, and that's just because, for instance, Kings is one book, or Chronicles, whereas we have First and Second Kings. Or the 12, They'll, we'll say we have 12 of those. They'll say that's one book, that's the 12. Um, we're in that latter prophet section, um, so Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12. Um, can just, for a minute or two, just review, and y'all can help me review. So Isaiah, what did we learn about Isaiah? What are some of the things? It's really high level, not details. Isaiah, hey, that works well. You should know. <laughs> about um, he- the difference between Hezekiah and Ahaz, right? Ahaz. Yep, that's right. And what was the what was the difference between them? Or? Does anybody uh, remember? So they were very different, right, in one sense. One was very righteous and one was very wicked, but there was one way they weren't different. What was the way they weren't different? What did Ahaz, what, Elsie? They both went to Egypt for help. Kind of, yeah, that's right. So they both didn't rely on the Lord when uh, an army was coming, essentially, right? So Ahaz was, uh, God gave him a sign to trust the Lord when the armies of Syria or Aram and Israel were coming and they didn't. He, he instead wrote to Assyria to get help. Not Egypt, but, but close enough. He wrote to Assyria to get help and they, uh, Assyria was going to end up being the problem that they had to deal with later. And Assyria was the one that eventually decimated, well, exiled the northern kingdom and decimated the southern kingdom. And then Hezekiah had a similar thing where Assyria was coming to, to uh, lay siege to them, which we'll read about in Micah in just a second. And he wrote to Babylon. He trusted in Egypt and wrote to Babylon, which God told him not to. And it turns out that Babylon was going to be the one that eventually take, took them to exile. So that was, that was Isaiah, and it was all really focused to a large degree around that event in 701 B.C., where Assyria came, surrounded the city, and the angel of the Lord destroyed 185,000 Assyrians and spared the city, but ultimately prophesied that they were going to be taken to Babylon because they didn't fully trust in the Lord. As good as Hezekiah was, he didn't fully trust in the Lord. Also prophesied a lot about restoration, their return from exile, the suffering servant, and ultimately God coming and saving his people. And then Jeremiah, what was kind of really high level for Jeremiah? He's also prophesying about coming exile and the fact that it'll be 70 years long. Yep, destruction of Babylon, by Babylon. And what was his advice to the people? to recognize that this was what the Lord had for him and settled down in Babylon. And Don't fight against it. Yeah, it's, it's nothing, but... it's not going to change. God has made up his mind. He's going to destroy the city. It's not going to change. So go out, submit, because you're not going to be able to, to overcome what God has already planned and decreed. Okay, obviously the new covenant was a really big part of Jeremiah as well that was prophesied. And then Ezekiel, what was kind of high level Ezekiel? Big section about restoration in 40 to 48, restoration of the temple and this temple service and priest and even the vision of the land. Okay. What was remember what the big issue was in Ezekiel? Isaiah. About the where? Where? Kind of where? And particularly what where? 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 What is? 
God yeah, where God's glory is, where God is, right? And, and, and God was in Jerusalem. And again, just like in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they were saying, well, God's here. I mean, we're going to be spared. And Ezekiel pictures God leaving Jerusalem and abandoning it. And where did he go? Where did Ezekiel see God's glory? Babylon. Yeah, he saw it by the river Chebar. And God was going to exile with his people. And then Ezekiel in his later vision saw God coming back to Jerusalem and being there with his people in a new, uh, new temple there in, in Jerusalem. Okay, so that's sort, of, that's sort of a really quick, really high-level overview of the first three. Now, we talked about the twelve. Um, you know, people will joke about Chronicles. Like, why is, what's the point of Chronicles, right? You already have kings. Right? There's nothing different. Well, really, there is, right? It's, a, it's written for a different purpose. Or people say that about the Gospels. We have four Gospels. Why do we need? They all kind of cover Matthew through Luke, at least, all seem to be very similar. But they're written, again, for a very different purpose. And we'll cover that when we get to New Testament survey. The 12 may feel that way a little bit. And especially today. Because what we're going to see today is Micah is essentially the story of Isaiah. It's essentially, in fact, there's texts within them that are completely duplicated. Um, again, we don't know who borrowed from who, just like in the Gospels. We don't necessarily know, you know, how that all happened, but we know that they both wrote, inspired by God, and uh, Isaiah and Micah are very similar. The stories they tell are very similar. We're going to find that Jeremiah is very similar to Habakkuk and Zephaniah. And we're going to find, we're not going to cover it today, but uh, the story of Haggai is very similar to Ezekiel. And so you're going to say... What's the point of the 12, right? And I've been, made a big point of how the 12 actually is going to do something that none of those three prophets did. What, and what was the focus of the 12? We haven't, we haven't covered it yet. If it, what was it? What? Not what. That was Jeremiah. Where? Not where. That was when? when, right? It was when. They're going to answer something that the Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel didn't answer. So whereas today you might wonder why we have the 12, because we're going to tell a very similar story. Next week... When we get to the conclusion, you'll see what they are really uh, bringing about, what they are really showing uh, that those did not. So let's start with Micah. Again, we'll just do four today, and we'll, they're very short books, Micah being the one long one of the, of the bunch, but uh, Nahum is three chapters, Habakkuk is three or four, and um, Zephaniah is just a couple. So they're very short books. We'll be able to read more than we have in the past when we had longer books. Um, but let's start with Micah. Um, here's just an introduction. Again, um, I told you the 12 are loosely chronological. So we are out of the sort of, uh, remember there were two kings in the 750s and before that, were, that reigned for almost half a century each in the northern and southern. It was a very prosperous time. We're out of that. So now we're getting to where uh, Assyria is getting strong and putting pressure on Israel and Judah. And at this point, uh, things are not looking so good. Whereas before, when prophets like Jonah and Hosea and Amos and Joel came, you know, they, it was kind of hard for them to hear that this judgment's coming because everything was so good. Rich, things were fine, they were at peace, there were no enemies. That's not the case anymore. At this point, Assyria is beginning to, uh, to come and be a world super, superpower. Um, Micah, uh, his main target was the southern kingdom. He actually speaks of both the northern and the southern kingdoms. Um, but he primarily was proph prophesying to the southern kingdom. Again, uh, as we just mentioned, he, we're going to find his stories just like Isaiah. It's not exactly the same, but he's going to prophesy at the same time about the same event with the same result. So here's our slide that we put for each of them. Again, same place as Isaiah, same time period. Okay, we'll... I've put this quote up before, I think. This is, a, this is a believer, you know, but just, hey, it's really hard to understand the prophets. We've laughed about that before. We'll see that each of these prophets has a very, it may not be on the surface easy to see, but a very structured way of presenting their prophecies. Extremely structured way, which we call a chiasm, which is where, again, it's kind of like the letter X. You know, you, you, you say a few things, you say a few things, and then you get to your centerpiece, and then you say the same things kind of in reverse, or similar things in reverse. And we're going to see that each of these prophets structures their prophecies that way, and you can really get a feel for what their main point is by looking at the center. And again, a lot of this is from this book, David Dorsey, Literary Structure of the Old Testament. Okay, so Micah, I'll just put it up here. Um, that's the structure of Micah. We're going to, we're going to read uh, the centerpiece, uh, 4 through 5. Micah... Uh, I'm going to make an argument next week that the 12 are one book and that they're structured in a certain way. And Micah is the centerpiece of the 12. So this is um, 
chapters four to five is the center of the center, as it were. It's the honeycomb or the center of the cinnamon roll. It is really good, right? Uh, this is the sort of the key uh, key chapter of the twelve, along with the end, because the end is going to really uh, answer the question of when. So Micah, uh, like the prophets before, you remember Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, they were all calls to repentance. <clears throat> there was hope that if they would repent, especially Joel early on, that if they would repent, God would avert the judgment that he had promised. With Micah coming, it's getting less and less so. The, the sin is getting more and more, and the chance of aversion of wrath is getting less and less. We're going to see in Habakkuk and Zephaniah, there's no longer a chance. It's like Jeremiah, as I mentioned. And they're just going to encourage the people, how does the righteous live in the middle of that? With Micah, it's, it, it seems as though, at least for the northern kingdom, Micah's going to say it's too late. For the southern kingdom, again, he's like Isaiah. He's going to say, really, kind of, we're, we're towards the end, but just know that God is going to spare you, as he did, uh, through, as he said through Isaiah. He's going to spare Israel, Judah, but ultimately they are going to be exiled because it's, it's just gotten too bad. So major themes, uh, the sin of Israel, in particular, the, the people and the leaders. Um, so if you, if you look in chapter 3, for instance, um, the prophets, uh, in verse 5. So as an example, the prophets, they, they, everything's fine as long as people are feeding them. But it's it, at the point where someone doesn't give them something to eat. When they have something to bite in their teeth, they cry peace. But against him who puts nothing in their mouths, they declare holy war. So, verse 9. Heads of the house of Jacob. They abhor justice. They twist everything that's straight. So the rulers of Israel in particular are bringing this about. Imminent judgment. Let's read in verse one, chapter 1 real quick. And this is where you'll get to... A feel for how it's like Isaiah, um, especially chapters 4 and 5, we'll see it, but this will set the context. So it's the same kings, verse 1, it's the same kings that uh, Isaiah mentioned Ahaz and Hezekiah. Micah was prophesying during those same times. He says, verse 2, that God is going to be a witness. He's coming, verse 3, from his place. He's going to come and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him. The valleys will be split like wax before fire, like water poured down a steep place. And this is because of the rebellion of Jacob and the sins of the house of Israel. He's going to make, verse 6, Samaria a heap of ruins. He's going to pour down her stones. So Samaria is gone. There's, there's no hope for Samaria. He's decided to do that. All her idols will be smashed, verse 7. All of her earnings will be burned with fire. So verse 8. He's going to lament and wail. Her wound is incurable. There's nothing that can be done about the northern kingdom. But, he says, it's come to Judah, verse 9. It's reached to the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. So you remember, y'all remember in Isaiah, they had that same language where um, when Ahaz called on Assyria to come, and he paid them to come and help him, there was the prophecy in verse 8 of Isaiah where it was going to come and reach even to the neck. Right, but go no further because again, God let Assyria destroy almost all of the Levant, almost all that area, but He protected Jerusalem from Assyria. And we see Isaiah, excuse me, Micah is the same way. It's reached the gate. It's come to the gate. Assyria is there, and um, a calamity has come down from Yahweh, verse twelve, to the gate of Jerusalem. All right, so that's where we're at in Micah. He's prophesying around that same event. Assyria is there. Now I want us to focus on. Um, uh, let's, let's read some of chapter 4 together. So chapter 4, uh, that's the context. The context is Assyria is outside the gate. The people are sinful, especially the leaders. And then chapter 4 and 5 is, again, the centerpiece of the 12. In chapter 4, Micah all of a sudden starts prophesying about something very different. He says it'll come about in the last days. So you see, he's, he's changed his frame of reference for a moment. Uh, Assyria is still outside the city. But he's now talking about the last days. That the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains, be raised above the hills, and people will stream to it. So Micah pictures a time when Jerusalem will be restored. It will be the center of the nations, and everybody will be coming to it to learn about God. You can read through those verses. Just I'll, I'll paraphrase quickly for time's sake. But nations are going to come and say, let's go learn from God there, from Zion. We can learn from his law. God will judge between peoples there. From Jerusalem. People will sit under their vine, under their fig tree. Nobody will make them afraid. 
So Micah pictures this day all the way through verse 8 about this kingdom, this dominion that's going to come. The former dominion will come. He's probably thinking back to like Solomon's dominion and how life was under Solomon and under David. That former dominion is going to come. But then, verse 9, it's kind of back to the present. But now, why do you cry out loudly? Is there no king among you? Or has your counselor perished that agony has gripped you like a woman in childbirth? So that's going to come, but right now, what's the problem? Why are you acting, you know? Why are you now in trouble like a woman in labor? who it's, The pains are coming and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do to stop it. What's the problem? Well, it's because their leaders have led them to this point and There's nothing that can be done. Writhe in labor to give birth, verse 10, daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth. For now you will go out of the city. Now you will, now you will go out of the city. Dwell in the field and who, where the, who's going to take them away? No, no, that's not who's outside the city, right? Who's going to take them away? Assyria, Assyria right? Assyria is the ones outside the city, but it says Babylon. That's right. It's just like Isaiah, right? God's going to spare the city, but they need to know they will be going to Babylon. They will be going to Babylon. But now many nations have been assembled against you. Assyria is out there, and Assyria was composed of many nations. They would destroy people, and they would add them to their army, and they would... They would come and fight against other nations who say, let her be polluted, let our eyes gloat over Zion. But they don't know the thoughts of Yahweh. They don't understand his purpose for he has actually gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. So God is not going to let Assyria be the ones. They are going to go to exile. They're going to go to Babylon, but God's not going to allow it. And God's going to use this as an opportunity to prophesy about something in the future where there will be a king. Remember Isaiah? There will be a king unlike Hezekiah who is going to trust in the Lord, who's going to be a different kind of king, who's going to be able to deliver the city. Their current kings are powerless to do anything. Arise and thresh, verse 13, daughter of Zion. For your horn I will make iron, and your hooves I will make bronze, that you may pulverize many peoples, that you may devote to Yahweh their unjust gain and their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. Now muster yourselves in troops, daughter of troops. They've laid siege against us. With a rod they will smite the judge of Israel on the cheek. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephratah, too little among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So who's that? Jesus. That's Jesus, right? So there's going to be a, there's going to be a king that comes. It's not like these kings that can't do anything. There's going to be a king that fully trusts in the Lord. That's going to be able to deliver from whatever threat comes. And that is Jesus. Is a prophecy, a prophecy that ultimately is fulfilled in Jesus. So it goes on to talk about this one will be our peace. So those, those sections are really kind of looking ahead to this future king that's not going to be like that. When the Assyrian evades our land, verse 5, when he tramples our cities, citadels, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. They will shepherd the land of Assyria with a sword, the land of Nimrod and its interests, and he will deliver us from the Assyrian. Unlike their current king, who is not able to do anything, God will deliver them, and God does in 701. Remember, deliver them from the Assyrian, and that's a foreshadowing of a future king who's going to be able to do that as well. He goes on to prophesy in verse 10 about the future period, but then he comes back in 6 and continues to finish out the story. But here, you see, Micah is just like Isaiah. Micah recognizes that Assyria is going to come, God's going to deliver them, but ultimately they are going to go to Babylon but there's going to come a day when there's a king that doesn't fail in that way. There's going to be a king that, that delivers the people in safety and restores their former dominion. That's the centerpiece of Micah. Um, ultimately, the centerpiece of the Twelve, it's, it's very hopeful, very hope-filled, but the story's not done because we're going to go on to Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, and we're going to see that Babylon is coming. Okay, the purpose of Micah is that God is going to deliver Jerusalem from Assyria. It's going to foreshadow future deliverance of Israel from all nations. But Israel is going to be exiled into Babylon because of her sin. The day of the Lord that Joel prophesied, it, Micah says it's going to come to Israel and it's going to come to Judah. It's going to come, Babylon's going to come, and that day of judgment is going to come. All right, I'm going to, for, for time's sake, I'm going to skip these. Um, but just, these are just slides that talk about how Micah builds on earlier revelation and how later revelation uh, builds on Micah. So I'm going to 
I'm going to skip those. Um, I'll give you just a moment to sort of quickly see them, but uh, these will be online uh, if you'd like to, to spend more time looking at those. All right, so we've done the first six books. Again, uh, it's called Repentance early on. Uh, Hosea, remember, introduced that uh, kind of timing, how the timing was going to go, and the, for many days they would be without a king, um, but then in the last days they would be restored. The rest of the prophets came and said, there's a horrible day that's coming. You've, if you don't repent, there's this awful day, day of the Lord that's coming. Repent. Um, Micah has said, it, it's here, and it's going to be Babylon. And that's where we're at so far with the 12. Again, not much different than what we saw with Isaiah uh, at this point. So Nahum, um, Nahum is a little bit later. This is after the northern kingdom has been destroyed, before the southern kingdom has been destroyed. And this speaks of the destruction of Assyria. So uh, in terms of the date, um, Assyria ended up being destroyed in 612. And that's what was prophesied by the book of Nahum. So this would have been sometime before 612 and sometime after 663 because in Nahum 3 there's a reference to Thebes and we know that Thebes had fallen uh, in 663. So sometime maybe around 650 Nahum is prophesying to the southern kingdom um, about Assyria and the destruction of Assyria. Now, Nahum, uh, at times, especially when he's to some degree mocking the king of Assyria, um, the king of Assyria, you know, the Assyrians are very proud and arrogant and haughty. You can read about that in Isaiah 10. And Nahum is, is essentially mocking them, saying, you are going to fall too. You may think you're strong, but you are going to fall too. So even though he does speak directly to the king in those, uh, he's really uh, directing the book primarily to the southern kingdom of Judah. Again, the northern kingdom is gone at this point. And here's what, uh, there's, here's what he says. Thus says in verse 12 of chapter 1, Thus says Yahweh, though they are at full strength and likewise many, even so they will be cut off and pass away. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no longer. So now I will break his yoke bar from upon you and I will tear off your shackles. Yahweh has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. So that's all talking directly uh, to the, the king of Assyria. But then verse 15, Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows, for never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. So while he is addressing the king of Assyria directly, this book is ultimately for Judah. And it's a recognition, again, that God is going to deal with Assyria. He's going to destroy Assyria. And he's going to do it for the sake of his people, Israel. Now, why is Nahum in the twelve? You know, what, why is there a prophecy about the destruction? I can think of several reasons. One, uh, it does make sense that he follows Micah. Again, Micah talked about how the Assyrian was going to be destroyed. And Nahum is going to prophesy how God is going to do that. Again, there's a future uh, uh, where this is going to come as well, where Assyria represents the nations that ultimately are going to rise up against God and, and God himself is going to deliver his people. But in this case, it was Assyria specifically um, that God is. So there's that, where Micah had said this was going to happen, and it makes sense for Nahum to follow that because he's showing how that happened and how God brought this to pass. The other thing I think that's a part of it is... Uh, God has talked about how the day of the Lord is coming, and the day of the Lord is going to be not just for Israel, but for the nations too. And we can be, and again, Babylon is the one that the prophets have consistently pointed to as the ones who are going to bring about this day of the Lord. And you see here that in 612, when Assyria was defeated, that was Babylon who did that. And so to another degree, I think the reason Nahum is here is because you can begin to see the day of the Lord is coming. It's beginning to happen. Babylon is beginning to go, grow strong, and that day of judgment is coming. So again, we're getting closer to, to this exile. Uh, we're beyond the northern kingdom. We're beyond Jerusalem being spared by Assyria. And we're beginning to get closer to uh, this day of the Lord that's been prophesied of Babylon coming and destroying the nations. Uh, structure, uh, God is a vengeful God. The book begins with a sort of a theology of God. You know, what is he like um, as an example 
verse 3 in chapter 1, or verse 2, A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is an avenging and wrathful. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. He takes vengeance on his adversaries. He reserves wrath for his enemies. But Yahweh is slow to anger and great in power. Yahweh will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And he talks about, again, what he is able to do in carrying out that wrath. That's how it begins. And then, again, we read 12 to 15. Uh, that For Israel, that's a good thing because he's going to use that vengeance on Israel's enemies and free Israel from that. And it's going to mean uh, not good things for Assyria and Israel's enemies because they're going to be um, receiving that wrath. At the same time, we know that Israel is going to receive it as well. Again, they were not immune from the day of the Lord because of their sin. That's what we'll get in the next two books. But for now, Nahum talks about what that is like for Israel's enemies and when God uh, is going to ultimately restore Israel through defeating their enemies. Okay, the character of God is a major theme. The judgment of Nineveh is a major theme as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do this again for time's sake. But the purpose of Nahum to declare God's imminent destruction of Assyria on behalf of His people Israel. All right, that gets us, that gets us through two of the twelve. And again, we will next week we're gonna, we're gonna put it all together. This is just that you still have to look at the individual books, but there is one story going through the 12 uh, that we'll put all together next week. But with Habakkuk, um, essentially with, you know, again with Joel, with Amos, it was you repent, maybe the Lord will avert disaster. With Habakkuk, with Zephaniah, we're going to see it's actually, it's, it's too late. It's coming and what do we do? And this was very similar to Jeremiah who said there's, there's nothing that's going to change. Here's what you do. Here's how you respond to it. So these are going to be very similar to Jeremiah. So Habakkuk doesn't explain. Uh, he doesn't. He just kind of comes right in and explains his oracle. He doesn't give uh, kings or anything like that. But it's clear that this is before Babylon because that's what the book's going to be about is Babylon's coming. And it's not as close as Zephaniah. So Zephaniah, we'll see when we read it, the day of the Lord is imminent. It continues to, we'll read a lot of Zephaniah. It continues to, Use the word near. It's near. It's here. And with Habakkuk, you'll see the end of the book is, I'm going to wait. You know, there's a, So it's close, but it's not quite as close as Zephaniah. So we don't know right when it is. It's just sometime before the Babylonian invasion in the southern kingdom. It's the only kingdom left. So we're sometime before the Babylonian uh, destruction of Judah. Here's another one of those chiasms. Um, and again, you guys, Habakkuk is a pro probably behind Jonah and uh, maybe Hosea, one of the more better known of the twelve. So you probably know the story. Habakkuk is com complaining a bit, saying, "God, how can there's so much wickedness in Judah? How can you, you know, sort of just not do anything about it?" And that's his sort of first complaint. And God answers, "I'm I'm about to do something about it. Actually, it's going to be something that you wouldn't believe. If, you know, it's going to make your ears tingle. He's going to bring this." fierce nation against them. And then Habakkuk complains again. How, how can you do that? How can you use a wicked nation against your people? And God says, trust me. Wait. And here's how you live. Here's how the righteous will respond in a day like that. And then he goes on to say, because Babylon itself will be punished. Yes, I'm going to use Babylon to punish my people, but Babylon itself will be punished. And my army, not Babylon, my army is going to come in the future and make all things right. And then God, Habakkuk says, okay, never mind. I'm not going to complain. I'm, I'm willing to wait. Even if in the, in the midst of this, there's no fig trees, there's nothing on the vine, everything's destroyed, I trust you, God, in the midst of it. And that's what we're going to see. Uh, the centerpiece is how the righteous live. They live by faith. And the New Testament picks this up um, for, good, for good purpose. We'll talk about that in just a moment. That's the structure Habakkuk sees Babylon coming. He knows that they're going to. He knows that Judah is going to be punished. He knows there's nothing that God is very clear that this is going to happen, and God instructs Habakkuk, as a righteous one in Israel, how to respond. Okay, major themes: righteousness. There was no righteousness. That's what Habakkuk's initial complaint was. Um, no righteousness in Judah. Wasn't God going to do something about it? And then second. How can God be righteous and use Babylon? That's the question. Um, that doesn't seem right. And so Habakkuk is taught in this how he's able to 
how God is able to do that and be righteous because it, it depends on something he's going to do in the future. And then again, how do, the, how do the righteous, how do the just live in the midst of God's plan? And then again, waiting is another key theme. Habakkuk's saying, how long am I going to have to wait? And God says, that's what the righteous do. They're going to wait for God to vindicate. And Habakkuk says at the end, I will wait. So let's, let's read a little bit of Habakkuk. I think we're doing uh, good on time so that we can read a little bit more. We're doing good. I'll tell you just a second. It's a little bit after... A little bit after noon. So let's read just a little bit of Habakkuk, um, and then we'll read some of Zephaniah and we'll be done. So here, the oracle, verse 1, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Yahweh, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, but you don't save. That's his complaint, as we mentioned. And God answers in 5. Look among the nations, observe. Be astonished, wonder. I'm doing something in your days you wouldn't even believe if you were told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. They mock at kings, verse 10. Rulers are a laughing matter to them. They'll sweep through, verse 11, like the wind and pass on. So clearly this, this destruction from Babylon is coming. Here's Habakkuk's second complaint. Let me put the um, structure up there while we're reading. Aren't you from everlasting, O Yahweh, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Yahweh, has appointed them to judge, but you, O Rock, has established, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. You can't look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? So that's Habakkuk's complaint, and here's God's answer. This is the one we want to focus on. I will stand on my guard. So he's complained to God, and Habakkuk says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I'll stand on my guard post, I'll station myself on, my, on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Then Yahweh answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is, for, is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. So he's going to give Habakkuk a vision. We're going to read about it in chapter 3. It's not going to, it's not going to come immediately. You're going to have to wait for it. Behold, as for the proud one, which is the king of Babylon, the person that Habakkuk was complaining about, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. So the righteous person is going to live by faith in the midst of this. Again, the New Testament picks that up. The New Testament talks about um, how, in fact, the book of Hebrews uses Habakkuk. It's actually quoted several times. It's quoted in Romans, it's quoted in Galatians. But the book of Hebrews uses this because um, you know there was a similar thing going on in the book of Hebrews where they were being... Uh, persecuted. They were being, they were in tough, in a tough situation. Like Habakkuk, whose city and nation was about to be destroyed, and they were going to be without. The people in Hebrews were having their possessions taken. They were being persecuted, and it was going. You know, they were saying, "Well, what do I do in the midst of this?" And God said, "Don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back to that. Trust me. You know, allow the. the there were people before you who had faith in the midst of it, and they had a city that they were looking forward to." Trust me, that's how the righteous live. They live by faith. And that's the message to Habakkuk here as well. And then God goes through verses 6 through 20 of that same chapter. We won't read that. And talks about uh, how Babylon is going to be punished. And then here is the, uh, here is the future sort of vision uh, where God talks about how his army is going to come and he's going to make things right. He's going he's to act on behalf of the righteous. Let's just read verse 13, for instance. You go forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You strike the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. So the righteous trust that. The righteous knows that's coming in the future. They live by faith in that. They trust God through the midst of it. And here's Habakkuk's response in verse 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble. It's not an easy thing he's going through. Um, it's not like, it's, it's simple, 
or easy. I mean, he was trembling. It was very scary. This was a fierce nation that was coming against them. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. But here's his response. So the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in Yahweh. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Yahweh, God, is, the Lord Yahweh is my strength, and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me to walk on my high places. So there's, there's a righteous person in how they're going to respond as God brings that judgment. So let me get back to the purpose. And Habakkuk is no longer to encourage people to repent. Remember all those early ones where the centerpiece that we looked at was a call to repentance. Now, no longer. Now it's an instruction for the righteous because there, there's, no, there's no point anymore. It's, the destruction is coming, and here's how the righteous will respond to it when it comes. Again, very similar to Jeremiah, as we discussed. We mentioned it's quoted in, in often in the New Testament. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll review at the end of Zephaniah. Let's get into Zephaniah, and then we'll we'll be finished for today. So Zephaniah, um, I can't remember if it's two or three chapters. It's three. Um, Zephaniah is uh, is it's like the eleventh hour. It's, it's like the end of Jeremiah. We're on the cusp of destruction. It's here. It's come. In fact, we're going to read most of chapter 1 um, because I want, to make a, I want to make a point of how Zephaniah describes the coming destruction. But Zephaniah is you know, right before, again, perhaps uh, during the reign of Josiah. I think that's um, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon. So he was, he was right. Josiah died in 605. Um, so he was sometime before that, during the reign of Josiah. The day of the Lord is extremely near at this point. So Zephaniah's name means uh, God hides or uh, hidden by God. And that's the centerpiece of his book as well, where um, you know, he calls those that trust in God to, to seek God and perhaps be hidden in the day of judgment, in the day of destruction. And we're going to read that in just a moment. In fact, let's start in chapter 1 um, and just see how Zephaniah describes the day that's coming. Remember, Joel was three chapters, but he had more references to the day of the Lord than anybody. Zephaniah is second, and he's just three chapters as well. So very similar book. Joel was saying the day of the Lord's going to come. If you don't repent, Zephaniah is saying the day of the Lord's coming. What, are you gonna, what, what is God going to do for those that are in the midst of it? Verse 2. Listen to how he describes this. And, and after we finish reading, I want to ask you, is there an event that this language makes you think of other than the day of the Lord of Babylon? Does it remind you of anything else? So let me, let me read first and then see if, if you can think of what it might sound like. Zephaniah 2, I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked, and I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. So again, remember, he's prophesying about Babylon coming. But does that sound like anything else to you? Any other events? The flood. The flood. Doesn't it sound like the flood? I mean, he's, he's saying this is going to be a complete and utter destruction. I mean, he's as bad as it's been pictured, uh, you know, the wolves and the, uh, I forget how Habakkuk was just describing the horses of the Babylonians that made him tremble, as bad as the locust army of Joel, as bad as it's been described, nothing has been described this bad uh, heretofore. <clears throat> I will stretch out my hand against Judah, and it, and it would almost make you think, this is, he's got to be talking about something else, right? It's this, this completely destroyed, but, but we'll read on. It, it's clear that he's talking about Babylon. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. And those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven, those who bow down and swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following Yahweh, those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him. Be silent before the Lord Yahweh, for the day of Yahweh is near. This isn't far off. This is near. It's coming soon. Yahweh has prepared a sacrifice. It's already prepared. He's consecrated his guests. He talks about, It'll come about on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice. I will punish the princes the king's son, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold. 
I'm going to skip down a bit on 10. On that day, declares Yahweh, there will be a sound of a cry. Wail, O inhabitants, for the people of Canaan will be silenced. Verse 12, it will come about at that time, I'll search Jerusalem with lamps. He's going to punish the men who are stagnant in spirit. He's going to find them out. The people who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. Their wealth will become plunder, their house is desolate. Near is the great day of Yahweh, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of Yahweh, in it the warrior cries out bitterly. He describes the day, it's a horrible day, destruction, trouble, distress, darkness, clouds against the fortified cities. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind. Nothing will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. He'll make a complete end of all the inhabitants of the earth. That's a horrible sounding, very near day that's coming. And again, based on all we've read in the 12, based on Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, we know that um, primary reference here is to Babylon and the coming destruction. Let's read uh, chapter 2. Gather, yourself, gather yourselves together, gather. He's not going to call them to repent so that the, the day might be averted. It's too late. Gather, O nation without shame, before the decree takes effect. There's, it's been decreed. It's going to happen. Before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. Here's the key verse. Seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. That's the best to offer right now, is that hopefully you can be hidden when this day of wrath comes. He's going to go on to talk about the judgment of the nations, the judgment of the leaders, and ultimately the restoration of Israel. Again, just like Jeremiah, he said, submit, maybe you can be hidden, but there was a future that both Jeremiah and Zephaniah predict. He says, therefore, wait for me, verse 8 of chapter 3, for the day when I rise up to the prey. Indeed, Midas is not going to do it right now. He's given up the people, but there's going to come a day that they can live by faith in, Habakkuk, and if they're hidden, they can maybe... Uh, live towards that day when he, God, will pour out his indignation and his burning anger. But not for now. For now, Babylon is coming. The day is coming. Okay, day of the Lord again. You just see it repeated over and over throughout um, the book. Again, there's just so many, so many references to it that we just read. And that day, and that day, Yahweh's anger, his jealousy, his zeal, and then ultimately the restoration of Israel. Purpose is to announce the nearness and terror of Yahweh's coming day of wrath and declare the means by which the righteous might survive in the midst of it. Okay, we talked about the flood and how similar the language was to that, and that will become important next week when we talk about the twist in the 12. Next week is going to be the thing that makes it... Uh, not just like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And they're gonna, there's going to be a twist in the story that's different than them. And it'll be important uh, that we call out just how um, high the language or just how uh, universal the language of Zephaniah was. Okay, and that gets us through our nine books. And then next week we'll do Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And then we'll tie the 12 together, tell the whole story. And uh, we'll be finished with Old Testament survey. So let me pray for us, and uh, we'll be we'll be dismissed. God, thank you for your word, and thank you for uh, again your even your prophecies, Father, that are not always clear. They they are can be very hard to understand. Even even now, God, there's future events that you have revealed much, but not all. And yet, Father, there's so much to be learned, uh, so much to be seen about how you orchestrate events, and in particular, God, about your omniscience. That's what I think about most, Father, when I think about your uh, ability to prophesy future events, and is that you know ahead of time, God. You know everything. And I praise you for all of your knowledge. I praise you for all that you know. And I ask that uh, you would help us, no matter what, it looks like around us, it may look like that the wicked rule and there's no point in following you. It may look like uh, a day of wrath is coming and there will never be anything different. There will never be a future day where the tables are turned. But God, give us the faith to trust you and your promises and give us the, uh, 
courage to seek you in the midst of that and be hidden in your day of wrath. God, I just thank you for uh, this time that we had together as a body and just pray that as we go into the week, you would encourage us and help us to love you with all of our heart and love each other the way we'd want to be loved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.